Hello, I'm Scott Lambert. The most beautiful harbour in the world, two fleets of tall ships, tens of thousands of small craft, a prince and princess, and a cast of millions. Now that was a celebration. No matter where you were on the 26th of January, 1988, it was impossible to see everything. I'm delighted to bring you all the highlights, from Portsmouth to Sydney Harbour, right through to the fireworks display. These great events will live forever in Australia's history. Open sea. This is what we came for. At last we're free, sailing as a fleet. One could even believe the first fleet is with us. <laughs> we're sailing west to avoid being pushed by the winds into the Bay of Biscay off Portugal, spotting the ships of the fleet when we can. Tucker Thompson, the baby of the fleet, made it all the way from New Zealand. Anna Christina, 99 years old, who joined us from Norway. Amarina, the Swedish barkentine, the largest of the fleet. Bounty, replica of the infamous mutiny on the Bounty. And the flagship Soren Larsen, the elegant British brigantine, today gave refuge to a fellow traveller. 2982, 45, 38, 1600. Hut, hut. In our new home, everyone has their own fears. The fear of going overboard, the fear of sharks, the fear of confinement or wide open spaces. But for most, the fear of going aloft for the first time is the most terrifying. Terrifying is, is all relative. I mean, I consider living in, in some place like New York City terrifying. Anna Christina's skipper, John Sorensen, is only 25. He seems a pretty relaxed bloke. We call his ship the hippie ship, a gypsy of the seas. Hello, Christina. Christina yeah, we're just passing Amarina now, and uh, we're going on the other tack now, and uh, go on the same course as you, so we're at the bottom of the line together with Amarina for now. Roger, roger. Amarina, Amarina, this is Sorensen. Uh, the Commodore is uh, British. 
nothing bad about British, but British is more uh, stiff, I think, compared with Scandinavian. I'm Scandinavian. Motoring. Okay, pull in the provider. The smaller ships sail fast with light winds, but the large ships need strong winds. So we're already becoming two fleets, the fast and the slow. Well, I like the vitality of these Vikings, who don't even wear safety harnesses. So tomorrow morning, Tenerife, the Canary Islands. A chance to meet the rest of the fleet. May the 29th, and Tenerife looks as dry as a pommy's towel. Maybe it's because we've been surrounded by water for three weeks. It's taken this long to really get the feel of the ship at sea, and now we're going back ashore. King. And 200 years ago today, I had a dream about getting together a group of people to reenact the first fleet. So, with much graft, corruption, offers of free beer, we got together the best fleet possible. <laughs> Bounty is a challenge in itself. I mean, what other ship in the fleet has the rig of 200 years ago and on deck is more or less an exact replica, as much as one can be, of the original ship which Bly himself sailed over the seven seas. I think it's a fascinating challenge to anyone to be on board this vessel. Yeah, feel it. When you're going back down, what you do is uh, the technique for going down is in fact more difficult than going up in some respects, but uh, it's just a matter of climbing down and then uh, you can hang in free space for a while if you want. <laughs> <laughs> We're on latitude 00. .00. In fact, we're on the equator, and as you can see, it's not as calm as the mill pond. A lot of people remember Coleridge's words, as still as a painted ship, 
upon a painted ocean. But that's not the situation here, because this is called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, where the Northeast Trades and the Southeast Trades meet each other. And there's nowhere for them to go except up. As a result, you don't get the normal pattern of winds. You get squalls, you get storms, you get winds from all points of the compass. sail onto Cape Town and Sydney. Fleet organizers say they won't be able to answer that question until they meet the ship captains tomorrow to discuss money and receive a final response, hopefully a commitment from the federal government. In Rio de Janeiro, Ian Hislop, 11 a.m. Once more. You know, we're, we're, we're do-gooders, we're doing good for Australia. Why can't the government um, keep backing us? But that's not what's going to happen. As he said, sailors got themselves into that mess. Sailors will have to bail out their own ships. Bail out? No, no. Bailing's a question for sailors, not for prime ministers. These people are a private enterprise, so... You now, if they've made bad decisions and bad assumptions, then uh, that's something that they will basically have to live with. Many of us are taking a break from the problems of the fleet, hoping that a miracle will somehow come along and there'll be enough money to sail on. Somewhere in the middle of the South Atlantic. 14 days out of Rio, four months out of England. And the dreaded message has hit us. Man overboard. We thought it would never happen. One of our family is out there, drowning, alone. Okay, John, what do you say? Yes, I agree with trade wind, uh, what, we, what we should do, because that's where we have been uh, looking this morning. So that makes it 15... Uh, it's been in there six hours now. Chances are, even if we find him, probably dead. The uh, actually fact that uh, the, the person probably not is alive anymore. Yeah, what we've heard is that uh, Henrik was uh, trimming a headsail sheet and... Uh, 
it was flogging so badly it threw him over the side. He was, he was, he was, he was just in the yelling. Stadium. I mean, he was just yelling. He was, he was up here. I mean, like really panicked, and and his voice was full of water, and his eyes were. I don't, I don't even know if he was aware that Johan jumped in the water. You know. And finally, in the in the early evening, when the sun went down again and started becoming dark, that uh, that we realised Henrik is dead. He's gone. Then we had a little um, funeral, a little ceremony on our afterg. And that night, uh, people started talking about how good a guy he was and so on. But it, and it all ended up with that uh, we all sat up here in the Arctic in one little group with everybody's hands in each other, and we cried. August the 30th, over three months since we left England, and we're not even halfway to Australia. Family and friends back home seem to belong to another life. Strong winds and rough seas continue, but we're making good time towards Africa. Henrik Nilsson's death off the Anna Christina a week ago woke us up to the real dangers around us. We're not just a reenactment, we're the real thing. His loss has deepened our sense of family. The fleet has come closer together, and even the skipper's kids are now our kids too but it doesn't stop us wanting to get to land. September the 9th, Cape Town at last. Table Mountain is a great sight after a month in the South Atlantic. I wonder what sort of reception we're gonna get at the docks. South Africans are rolling out the red carpet. I wonder how much propaganda they'll make out of this. seems just like any other busy modern city but it's a bit of a puzzle there are blacks and whites in the streets buses hotels working or just touring i wasn't expecting that but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes as a trading outpost it's a bit of an oasis i can't get over the idea that they should be having all these problems <laughs> This is the sailing we came for. The new trainees are learning the ropes and finding their sea legs. After five months at sea, <laughs> I know how they must feel right now. We're on top of the roaring 40s, the farthest south we've been. Winds are south-southwest 30 knots and it's blowing dogs off chains. 
you can really feel the ship respond, like a greyhound let loose. The largest swells in the world have been recorded around here. After 37 days at sea, finally something that doesn't rock and roll. The island of Mauritius, the summit of an undersea volcano as extinct as the dodo bird. There was big excitement on the flagship. Funny how the Poms love a bit of ceremony. We didn't have to go to Mauritius. Mauritius came to us. What an amazing multicultural mix. French, African, English, Indian, Chinese, or a mixture of some or all of them. It's an independent democracy now, still part of the British Commonwealth, but the main language is French because the French were here before the British. Such warm people. I wonder what they think of us. It wasn't long before we were reviving ourselves with Sega, an erotic Creole music which celebrates rhythm and body heat. Know what I mean? We did speak only to break the silence of the sea, all in a hot and copper sky. The bloody sun at noon right above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Joined her on a cold December morning. Morning! A flapping of me flippers to keep me warm. Warm, warm. With a south cone hoisted as a warning. Warning! To stand by the common of the storm. Storm, storm! Wherever you may be in Australia, we bid you welcome this morning. It is indeed your day. Uh, it may be happening here in Sydney, but no matter what part of Australia you may be in right now, we very much hope that by being with us, the Seven Network today, you'll get a complete coverage of what is happening here and indeed feel very much a part of the spirit and the excitement of this truly tremendous occasion. So let's cross right away to the stars of our show, namely the ships, the crews, and the passengers of the First Fleet reenactment voyage. Behind us, we've got the full fleet, the 11 ships. For the first time ever since leaving Portsmouth, England, when the Queen farewelled us, we've got full 11 square riggers in the fleet. So it's just a fantastic moment for the whole of Australia. On board the, uh, the ship last night was very emotional and sort of a, an air of anticipation and excitement. How are you feeling last night? Get much sleep? Edgy, too nervous, too excited. Couldn't sleep a wink, didn't even try. But you see, 
Today is the People's Day because this is the People's Fleet. The government didn't want this to happen. They said it couldn't be done. They didn't want it to happen. But the people, the Channel 7 people, the Macquarie people, the people of Australia all chipped in and put the money where the mouth was. And this is the fleet that they brought to Sydney. So everybody should celebrate today because this is their fleet. And here we can see now something of the, the spectator fleet beginning to build up as the, the first reenactment fleet went their way up the east coast of Australia to truly a rendezvous with history at 11.45 this morning at Farm Cove. And now let's take a look, if we may, at the Young Endeavour. There she is, the Young Endeavour, which of course was presented by His Royal Highness Prince Charles to the people of Australia only yesterday. And she is Britain's official bicentennial gift, and isn't she magnificent? A brand new brigantine. She was built in 1986 at Lowestoft, of course, in England. And her maiden voyage has taken her from England around the Cape of Good Hope to Sydney Harbour on this very special day. Move. We're now looking at the Harbour Bridge, of course, the famous Sydney coat hanger. And what a scene that is. There must be hundreds and hundreds of boats now coming under the bridge, taking up position, ready for the great day's activities. Darling Harbour, of course, has been the scene of the tall ships. Now the tall ships are moving out, and they've come into their own mooring positions here in the harbour. It really is a pretty picture. Those white ships on a blue, blue Sydney Harbour. So I guess it's the right time now to be out sailing before... Oh, look, the Oriana, in miniature. Indeed, Isn't in that miniature. Fabulous? In fact, I did see a P&O flag on the Bounty. And, of course, uh, this is a miniature of the Oriana, which is a P&O ship flying the Australian Red Ensign, too. Look at that. And look at the people now gathering in the background. They've got their flags flying on their small craft. They're all hovering around, waiting for the major activities to take place. And, of course, that won't be long off. Oh, right. I have with me the, the captain of the Sonoma Larson. Tony, how are you? Well, um, I've got a bit of a bad cold, which is a bit unusual for Sydney. But, um, no, I'm ecstatic, really. I really am. This is quite fantastic. Um, this is the accumulation of seven years planning. My involvement started seven years ago with the ship. We've done nine months at sea to get here nearly, 22,000 miles. And there's just all these people. And there it is, the south head, the north head. It's opening up before us. It's just great. Words can hardly describe the scene that we're seeing. Where in the rest of the world could you see something like that? Look, the adrenaline is pumping. This is, uh, well, I've never seen anything like this before. So many craft out there to welcome the first fleet. And how appropriate that they've done this great deed. They've commemorated Australia's history and heritage. And now their recognition is there for all to see. Look, this scene will be seen right round the world and what a proud moment it is for Australia and particularly the 
men, the crew, the passengers on board that fleet. Jonathan, how do you feel now? Come on. It, incredibly humbled. It, it's, it's an honour and a privilege to be an Australian. I'm just so grateful to my fellow Australians. I want to say thank you, Australia. Thank you, Australia, for putting the first fleet on. Thank you to the people of Australia for making it possible. Thanks for coming out here and meeting us. What a day for Australia. What a, what a uniting day. Everybody must be proud to be an Australian. We set out, we set out to reenact the voyage of the first fleet, but we seem to have made history ourselves. I, we, we, we're being greeted like conquering heroes, and that's a very humbling experience. And I think it, I think it shows maybe we passed the test. It's certainly drawn attention, it's drawn attention to the incredible achievement of the first fleet 200 years ago. And I think we probably put on a history lesson to everybody in Australia and, and even around the world. I think it's, um, I think it's probably Australia's biggest day. Did your heart stop as we came through the heads and you saw it all in front of you? I could not conceive. I would never have been outrageous enough to dream up a welcome like this. This, this is unbelievable. Have you ever seen anything like this? What, what, never in my entire life have I ever seen something like this. What, what could you compare this to? An Olympic Games, the opening of the Opera House? It, there's just nothing. This is, this is Australia's finest hour. And yet, and yet, we the people put the fleet on. If nothing else, this shows that the people of Australia love their heritage, respect it, and want to honour it. If Governor Philip could see us now, he would weep. He put so much, as did all the first fleeters, into sailing in here 200 years ago. They put so much into building this country. Now they would weep. They would be deeply honoured. Do you feel like weeping yourself? I mean, do you feel that? Of course, of course. I'm numb. I'm numb by I, I don't deserve this. But it's, it's, such, it's such a reward to the hundreds of people that have sailed these ships around the world. We've come across the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean. We've lost Henrik Nielsen on the way. But what a welcome. This is like a dream. I mean, it really is. There, were, there would be 5,000 boats around us. God's turned on the sunshine. God protected us the whole way across. The oceans let us through. We were blessed. He must have wanted it to happen. And I just think it's just the most wonderful blessing to be an Australian in Australia today. And if this doesn't make us proud and united as a people, then nothing will. I think it's a great start to our birthday party. I've got a really deep love for my country and my history. I have a passion for what has made Australia the country it is today. And I want everyone to share that. And if we can share that, we can go on to the future and make a new beginning as a united nation. And look at it, we're all united here today. This is the start of our third century European settlement. Let's go into the future as the great nation we really are. But from all of us at Channel 7, Jonathan, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. <laughs> well, thanks Channel 7 and thanks Australia. Uh, thank you, Morris, and thank you, Jonathan, and uh, congratulations from everybody right across Australia because you're the fellow that really thought of it and somehow managed to force it right the way through. And here we are, this incredible occasion here this morning, and I think no matter where you may be, whether you are in Sydney or in Perth or in Adelaide, Darwin or Brisbane, whether you're in a small little tiny outback town somewhere in Australia, surely it must be a moment to be proud of. It's great to be Australian. Look at that Australian flag at the masthead. It's so appropriate that we pan on that shot on the uh, ship there. And I must say to Jonathan that he inspired the design of certain flags for the fleet, including the heritage flag, and how accurately it sums up what Jonathan's been doing and what he's achieved. The Queen Anne flag of 1788, the national flag today combined together. 200 years of great Australian history. There we see uh, clearly the bounty with those topsails like that slowly moving in still uh, into the harbour. Uh, we saw there the four shores of, of Manly in the corner there. Manly, incidentally, was one of the first places within Sydney Cove to be given the name. And it came from the very Manly uh, Aborigines there. They came down and waded into the water to the boats and met Governor Phillip and showed a very manly attitude, and that's where it gets its name. Thank you, Brian. Eye of the Wind we see on our screen right now, something about her, she's privately owned. Uh, in the past 11 years, apparently, she has notched up 250,000 sea miles, and she's carried 5,000 voyages around the world. Uh, her film appearances include Blue Lagoon, 
Taipan and Savage Island, so she is indeed a film star. Although she has only actually sailed from Fremantle on this particular occasion, she's a pretty fast ship due to her very large sail area and a well-designed hull. And over that 250,000 sea miles that she has travelled, she's been round the world twice. She's a beautiful looking ship. Have you ever seen so many beautiful sailing ships in such a small space? I look guess at, not. Look at the bounty going past there. It really is quite an emotional moment for all Australians to see something like this right here in Sydney Harbour. The oh. contrast between the new and the old. A luxury perfect. cruiser and an ancient looking sailing ship. Well, we keep on thinking that we can't produce more superlative pictures of what is going on down there on Sydney Harbour, but every time we seem to come back to this wide shot from the helicopter, it gets better and better, and the ships are becoming closer and closer. All the more reason for us to be thankful there's only a very slight wind at the moment. What a superb shot there of the bounty being escorted in very slowly down into Sydney Harbour. You know how you normally look at uh, boat moorings all around the harbour and you see dozens of boats that seem to sit there all year long and no one ever uses them? I can guarantee you today there will not be a boat on a mooring in Sydney. They're all out here. We estimate several thousand boats on Sydney Harbour. Now what we have at the moment is uh, the Bounty Boys have sailed all the way. Sailed all the way from Sydney to London and now they're back in Sydney again. You boys must be overwhelmed that you've uh, rejoined Sydney here today. Oh yeah, it's a great day. Excellent yeah. feeling. 33,000 miles. In fact, you have a little uh, war dance you'd like to do for us. Yeah, right. Ready? We're the bounty boys. That's what one here at sea does too, obviously, Roger. Now look at them up the mast there, what a vantage point that is. Sitting on one of the yard arms, a perfect view, view on a perfect day. And what a fantastic welcome it is. Well, I'm not quite sure that I'd like to be doing that, but I admire those young ladies for being able to do it. And as you say, what an incredible shot. Look at the fire float out there too. Well, perhaps if you and I had been at sea since May last year, we might have had the practice and be able to do it. Soren Larsen. And of course, at this point of time, we're awaiting the arrival of uh, royalty. And of course, that will be an ultimate salute to the fleet. The fact that we do have them here to welcome the fleet. And of course, everyone else in Sydney is out on the harbour welcoming the fleet as well. Well, there's an incredible shot. It's the sort of thing that you normally see when there's a forest of masts at anchor, but not on this occasion. On this occasion, they are out in the middle of the harbour awaiting the the arrival of this first fleet as it moves truly majestically down the harbour. In a few moments' time, look at the shot of the crowds of people. Look like currants on a cake, don't they? In a few moments' time, the prince and princess will be arriving at the Man of War steps. It is a perfect reception for both the royal party and the ships. The sun glistening off the water and everything going like clockwork. Well, there we see the shot uh, of the forecourt at uh, the Opera House. The crowds waiting, the special guests waiting for this historic moment. And I'm sure all eyes are focused right now on that launch, which is getting very close to Man of War steps. What an incredible view of all the people waiting on this foreshore for this great occasion. The Guard of Honour waiting. The Heritage Guard also waiting. Looking really spick and span too.
Yeah. Well, amongst other things, by being here, we can't get sunburnt, that's for sure. <laughs> and the beautiful hat that Princess Diana was wearing will ensure that she won't get sunburnt either. She looks magnificent. Well, she has the most magnificent peaches and cream complexion that you've ever seen. And we can now see her dress. It, in fact, is a, f a dress trimmed superbly in white with the white trim on her matching hat. And we've, we've decided to call that green bicentennial green. It's, it's almost got a blue tinge to it, but it's, it's green and she's trimmed her entire outfit in white. And here we see right now the first of the aircraft arriving, the first of the aircraft for the fly past. magnificent voice of leading soprano Joan Cardin, together with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and Second Military District Band with Advance Australia Fair. There remains one vital factor in the answer to the question, who is an Australian? And that factor is a commitment to Australia and to its future. It is that common commitment which binds the Australian born of the seventh or eighth generation and all those of their fellow Australians born in any of the 130 countries from which our people are drawn. In Australia, there is no hierarchy of descent. There must be 
no privilege of origin. The commitment is all. The commitment to Australia is the one thing needful to be a true Australian. And today, my fellow Australians, at this historic place and at this historic hour, let us all renew that commitment. Our commitment to Australia and to Australia's cause, the cause of freedom, fairness, justice and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my wife and I are delighted to be able to return to Australia at this very special time to celebrate with you your nation's bicentennial. It is a historic and splendid occasion for all of us, not only here in Australia, but all over the world, and not least in the United Kingdom. The modern nation of Australia began here 200 years ago today. They were harsh beginnings, and the people who were sent here against their will had little cause to rejoice, and all that was just yesterday. As history goes, 200 years is barely a heartbeat. Yet look around you and see what has happened in that time. A whole new free people. The people of a whole new free country, Australia. If it takes regular visitors from an old country to help you decide whether you should be celebrating or not, my wife and I will be glad to be of assistance. There is no point now in trying to gloss over the circumstances in which the country of which you are rightly proud began. Indeed, to face those facts is a necessary part of realizing just how proud you should be. For the sad truth is that in those early days of the colony, nobody was free. The men who guarded the convicts were in prison along with them. They were all a long way from home, and they all no doubt thought that Australia was the worst place in the world. But the best part about the story is that they made their prison into a new home, where freedom became not just a, the dream of those in shackles, but a reality for everybody. It didn't happen by accident. It took the intelligence and courage of brave men and women. Even within the astonishingly brief span which covers the whole history of modern Australia, the process of making liberty an institution took time. For the original people of this land, it must all have seemed very different. And if they should say that their predicament has not yet ended, it would be hard to know how to answer, beyond suggesting that a country free enough to examine its own conscience is a land worth living in a nation to be envied. Anyway, most people who live here now seem to think Australia is the best place in the world, and the rest of the world finds it difficult to argue. As it happened so long ago, many of you may not realize that part of my own education took place here in Australia. Quite frankly, it was by far the best part and something which I shall always cherish. It gave me an insight into the character of this country and the individuals who have shaped it 
by the force of their personalities and by their infectious good humor. While I was here, I had the pommy bits bashed off me, <laughs> like chips off an old block, and the results are only too obvious. I keep coming back for more, and it is always a special pleasure. But my wife and I are particularly glad to be here this year, on this great day, to help you, as if the Aussies needed help in anything, to celebrate your good fortune and to wish you well for a future that holds out such great promise. And in just a moment, we're going to be crossing over to the forecourt of the Opera House for the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, which together with the second military district band, accompanied by the Philharmonic Choir, are presenting a medley of national and patriotic songs. And as we listen, Let's just look at some of the magnificent sights on this harbour today.
continue to hear the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and the Second Military District Band with a medley of national and patriotic songs, here comes the official fly past. Somewhere of approximately 147 aircraft from the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. In the lead we have the Navy with uh, Squirrel helicopters, Sea King helicopters, Wessex helicopters and two Bell 206 helicopters. And they look indeed magnificent as they head towards the official fly past position over the opera house. Keeping a beautiful formation as well there. Glistening there on the, uh, the screens, the, uh, the sun coming through, the blades spinning around. Excellent. That was a sudden movement of the camera. Meantime, back with the aircraft for the helicopters. The order of a uh, flight is the naval helicopters first of all, followed by the uh, helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft of the Army. I think at the present time, if you can tell me, correct me, uh, John, I think it appears to be the naval contingent at the moment. Yes, it certainly does. And they're keeping that tight formation once again. They just went over the bounty a minute ago making a spectacular contrast. Here we are going over parts of Garden Island, or Garden Island in the backdrop, Woolloomooloo, and the Royal Botanic Gardens. Magnificent shots there of them. Over the canopy at the Opera House. Clearly the, uh, the sounds of the orchestra are now being drowned out by first of this contingent of 147 aircraft, this official flight pass to one of the presence of Prince Charles, Princess Diana, and the other important guests there at the Opera House forecourt today. Heading now across the Sydney Harbour Bridge towards the, the northern suburbs, and if you're at home, well maybe if you live on the north side of Sydney now, could just be the moment to pop outside and look up, because I'm sure that you will see them, and if you don't see them, you'll certainly hear them. I think you want to block your ears as they go over. It must be <laughs> quite a noise going straight over your heads. Well, there goes the Navy. Mm. And to the singing of Rule Britannia in just a moment, we should see the Army. you are an expert to pick exactly who is what at the moment and I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, are you doing any better John? No I'm not really, they look like a lot of little buzzing bees up there. At the distance it's very hard to tell which is which but certainly the effect is spectacular. And uh, not wishing to downgrade any of the aircraft that we're seeing but uh, at the very end of the fly past we should see uh, the F-111 strike aircraft, the Mirage fighters and then I guess our hope for the future, 20 FA-18 Hornets, which of course are our newest. Yes, and here comes the planes now, coming through. Once again, keeping a beautiful formation and making really quite a sight. I wonder and whether I could venture a, a guess and say I think they were caribous. That yes, were they were. Design, were they not? They were caribou. Background, if I'm right there, yes. And look at those headlands there into Sydney Harbour. Nielsen Park down below. Magnificent shots there taken from the airships above the aircraft, which are flying at somewhere between 700 and 1500 feet. An actual path, Point Piper, Garden Island, the Opera House, Miller's Point, and Ballarat Point. Surely adding the icing on the cake here today, the ships below, the aircraft above, and everything happening here on Sydney Harbour. You see right out there to the Blue Mountains, and right down the coast of New South Wales. And 
Now we see indeed the jet aircraft coming towards us. It should consist of uh, 15 F-111 strike aircraft. There they are right now, the F-111s, streaking across the sky. They've come in from Dover Heights. That's a very effective pattern, particularly with their wingspan, the shape that it is. Beautiful flying. The Governor of New South Wales must be particularly proud with his Air Force background. Ladies and gentlemen, Waltzing Matilda. Appropriate piece of music indeed.
clearly now, there we have the, the 11 ships of this first reenactment fleet moving into position in Farm Cove at the end of their historic voyage, their 248-day voyage from England. They left Portsmouth on the 13th of May, 1987. They went from there to Tenerife in the Canary Islands and then to Rio de Janeiro, from there to Cape Town, and from there to Mauritius, Mauritius to Fremantle, and from Fremantle to Botany Bay, and of course today from Botany Bay right here to Sydney Harbour, to the centre of it all. And this is indeed their moment of glory, and they are certainly entitled to it. And our congratulations to each and every one of them who have been involved in this historic voyage of eight months and one week from England to Australia, a reenactment of exactly what Captain Arthur Phillip did 200 years ago for his arrival here. There we see the view, a general view from underneath Sydney Harbour, and here we see the leader of the tall ships parade, the young Endeavour. Looking resplendent there with the white ensign, the Royal Australian Navy white ensign flying. She has the Union Jack at the masthead as well. Now we see the official party on board HMAS Cook. Prince and Princess of Wales, we can see, clearly see there at the moment. There once again, another shot of HMAS Cook as she moves steadily up harbour. Yes, and in fact, this scene is just packed with vessels, one passing the other. It's amazing there's any space at all to, uh, well, you could probably walk across the harbour. I think you it could. Looks like it. There again, we're looking at the, the young endeavour. And there is the general shot, which we've become almost accustomed to this afternoon. For the first time in our history, surely, we have never, ever seen as many ships as we saw out there today. And now there is the Gias, the Gia, beautiful ship moving down there. A dressing ship as she moves slowly and majestically down the harbour. She's 78 metres long and a mast height of 37 metres. Here we are at Fort Denison and a massive number of balloons being let off in celebration for this great occasion. What a sight. Fort Denison, of course, was originally known as Pinchgut used to keep some of the prisoners there and they used to get rather hungry. There's the Esperance, French ship, who I'm told has a lady skipper. And Why shouldn't she? She's doing a great job too, look at that sail. It really is quite a sight there, sail set, flags flying. There we see the Eagle, the United States Eagle, uh, preparing to uh, move out from the Parramatta River because she was well back in the parade of tall ships. A very large stars and stripes flying proudly. In fact, the Americans are putting in a considerable amount to the National Maritime Museum. Our next ship is the Asgard II, 
Asgard too was apparently, because of her limited amount of time, brought to Australia on a container ship. That incredible flag she's flying there, John. That's the Irish tricolour, green, white and orange. And then at the top we see a shamrock flying on the foremast. Emerald green, of course, the hull for Ireland. Of course. And there we see uh, Prince Charles uh, in the middle of our screen briefly with a digger's hat on. We'll see him again a bit later, I think. Because here we see the Nippon Maru. Masts are 50 metres high. It must have been a pretty close call going through underneath that bridge, I would think, John. Well, the rumour has it she should go under at low tide. <laughs> it's certainly a pretty picture. Such a massive ship. And with the beautiful bridge in the backdrop. And there's HMAS Cook once again from the air in her official position for the review of the tall ships. There's a much better shot of Prince Charles with his hat on. I'm wondering if the sun was possibly getting to him after all the amount that he's had to absorb today. I note he's wearing the uh, Royal Australian Navy badge on that hat. That, I think, is the Gorsh Fock. Yes, it is, with a beautiful figurehead there. What a fabulous special she is. How I'd love to sail on a ship like that. I think that's Mrs. Hawke down there we can see on the left part of the bridge there with the Macubra hat. What do you think about that, John? Well, I tell you what, they're uh, adventurers, aren't they? Uh -huh. With a figurehead and all, they're that dog. And there's Sovereign. Uh, took line honours and also handicap honours in the latest Sydney Hobart race and also line honours in the tall ships race. What a magnificent ship she is, Sovereign. And a distinctive colour of that, that bright red. Look at the crowd behind the Sovereign. That is incredible, that crowd. I mean, we've seen that gathering all day, and I'm sure many of them are still there waiting now for the climax of this great Australian historical day, namely the fireworks display coming up very soon. It was such a friendly crowd too, a very patriotic feeling. The magnificent and the enormous Nippon Maru we see there. The small size of that ferry seems to be dwarfed by the size of those enormous masts. And the contrast there between the modern ferry and then the backdrop of the buildings. Passing very close there to Fort Denison. You can see the Japanese flag flying off the gaff. That's the red sun on a white field. What a sight. In comparison to the tall buildings behind her, because of our perspective, she almost seems to dwarf them. Once again, Fort Denison there, and rather excited Prime Minister. Yes, with Prince Charles and also Mr. Unsworth. Prime Minister's having a very close look there. Our marina in the background there, one of the, uh, the first fleeters, the largest of the first fleeters. She's known as the, the luxury vessel of the first fleet, of course. There's a longboat alongside her as well. And now we see the fire tug, uh, Eve Burrows, Eva Burrows, in front there, and we see the Nippon Maru behind her. They've been used with great success, the fire tugs, to ensure that they could clear a passage for these tall ships as they endeavoured to, to clear out to sea. And there's the crew of uh, Lewin doing the can-can. Well, what balance, to say the least. <laughs> Wouldn't get me up there in a pink fit. Nippon Maru. Notice how they stand on those foot ropes or stirrups under the yard arm. And there's the unfortunate ship Abel Tasman, which of course was damaged in the collision with Gias in Hobart Harbour, which unfortunately meant she was unable to take place in the tall ship's race. And she has to go all the way back to Holland, I believe. We wish her luck. And now on our screen, we have the Spirit of New Zealand. Isn't she a magnificent vessel, that wonderful clipper bow, the long lines, the sweep, and the sails up. Now we see the Shabab of Oman, which was originally christened Captain Scott. Yes, she was built in 1971, 54 metres long, and of course uh, the Scottish sail training had it, but unfortunately they had some financial problems. And how's that for a shot of just sails? Once again, we see Prince Charles with his hat, which he seems to have taken to. 
and uh, an indication there of the Juan Sebastian del Cano, and also behind her, the Dam Mozazi. Notice them standing in those foot ropes. Now, at sea, of course, when they've got the sails set, they've actually got to stand on those foot ropes and hang on. That wouldn't be easy unless you were used to it, I wouldn't think. Particularly in a rough sea. That, I think, is the West German vessel once again. Yes, looking resplendent there as she comes almost towards us. Now passing beneath the bridge, or preparing to. The bridge is an ideal backdrop for these uh, occasions, isn't it? It is indeed. A glorious view. It's a pity those sails couldn't be set at that time, but unfortunately the wind wasn't blowing from the right direction. And now we see the Juan Sebastian del Cano moving into line to pass through the bridge. She's 113 metres long and carries a total crew of 310, a big ship. They all seem huge compared to the, the spectator craft around them. She's named after the first circumnavigator of the world. And here she comes right now, the Juan Sebastian del Cano, under the bridge. Almost looks like two shots there, doesn't it? it? Certainly does. Nowhere else in the world could you get a picture like that. Those gleaming white sails and the white hull against the green water. I note the police uh, leading in front there at the bow of the ship. Plenty of spectators up on the bridge too. And across at Kirribilli as well. In fact, spectators everywhere on and off the water. And I'm sure, as I mentioned earlier, many of them are there and many young children are waiting up tonight, especially for those fireworks, which is certainly going to be worth waiting for. I'm sure this is going to be an inspiration for further sail training in Australia. It's a great thing for the youth of Australia. Well, it should be, because many of these ships are within our vicinity, particularly from Japan, as an example. The Darmot Zezi. Beautiful Polish ship. And she's relatively new, too, and you can see that she's in trim condition. What an incredible experience for the cadets on board some of these ships. The experience of a lifetime to come to Australia on this momentous occasion, on our 200th birthday. And I trust that they have enjoyed it, and we wish them good sailing in the weeks and the months ahead. Well, I've heard no complaints from anyone. I'm sure they're thoroughly enjoying themselves. <laughs> Because of the slowness of the passage, they seem to take forever to move beneath the bridge and in front of the opera house. Sails in front of sails, you can say there. And there are the cadets we've just been talking about, the Darmozesi. Ah, oh, they're definitely enjoying themselves. They're all waving at us. They probably feel a bit sad because they're also leaving. Juan Sebastian del Cano under the bridge. There's the Polish flag flying there, the red and white flag. Back on the Darmodzezi once again. Look how small those pleasure craft looked in comparison to that wonderful ship. Well, according to our information, about 30 seconds to the start of the fireworks, and what a night we have for it too. Balmy and calm a harbour full of ships, many of them lit up, and uh, many very excited people who are holding their breath for the start of the fireworks, which will come to you from the Seven Network completely uninterrupted. Hope that you enjoy it.